video is broadcast on LSL Podcast Channel. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe to the channel. You are listening to The Laura Ingram Show. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving Eve, morning, day. Uh, and we learned this last night, just as about we, we were going to start the Ingram angle, that David Cassidy, age 67, you know, he, he's one of the first real tiger beat, kind of teen beat idol in the 19, late 1960s, 1970, 1971. I mean, David Cassidy was it. Like the Beatles we used to joke that we don't got, we don't got nothing on David Cassidy because he was just the he was the 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 big thing and the partridge family of course for anyone of a, of a certain age it was it was a show that was about family and music and madcap kind of slapstick comedy and it, it, you know I, I have great memories of that and david cassidy struggled sadly as his father did jack cassidy with addiction alcoholism uh, drug abuse and at age 67 he died of organ failure, apparently connected to dementia. You want a warning sign about drinking? I mean, that drinking brings on that dementia. You know it does. But he was surrounded by his family. Well, his and friends, massive and drug use. Massive drug use. I mean, so he just, he, and I think, I was thinking about this last night and all these you know, allegations of sex harassment and all, all the, everything that's swirling around. And we all have to remember that this is just a blink you know, it, the you know, when people say, "Oh, you have a show on Fox. This is great," and I ne- I don't really take the compliments, and I try not to take the criticism because it's like this. It, yeah, it's great. I'm going to try to do the best I can, and it's fun, and we have some. But it's it's ephemeral. His fame was ephemeral. He was the biggest music and and television star probably in the world in 1970-71, and. Then it was over, and he toured a little bit. But you know, once you reach that peak, you know the old saying: "The mighty shall fall." Oh, the mighty shall fall. Well, yeah, and we all have our ups and we all have our downs. It's how you how you deal with the down the, the downslope, which everybody has in their lives, whether it's a sickness or aging or or the death of a parent or sickness of a child. I don't know. I was thinking about that. You know, imagine how do you how do you go from being that child phenomenon? You're, he was what? Well, how old is he, Raymond? At the, at the height of the Partridge family, maybe twenty, twenty-one, yeah. maybe, maybe. And he had that kind of all-American smile. And a lot of people think that Shirley Jones was his mother. Ele- Evelyn Ward, the actress, was his mother. Shirley Jones was his stepmother because she married Jack Cassidy. Right. He ended up dying this terrible fire. I remember when he died. I was a little kid. I remember when he died. He was a he was a uh, terrific actor himself. And Shirley Jones, of course, played uh, singer, played Marion and yeah. the Music Man. And um, Raymond, unfortunately, killed off Shirley Jones <laughs> last night on Twitter, saying she had expired, much to the chagrin of her fan base, who <laughs> who came back at Raymond and said, Miss <clears throat> um, Jones is very much alive and well and still touring. And you know the worst thing? I'd seen her on stage. I just, I just thought I was confusing her with uh, the mother on the on the Brady Bunch, uh, Florence Henderson. Oh, who Florence did die? Anderson, who Westonality? You know, she Westonality is no more. You know what, people? I think this is a total stream of consciousness. But my friend Pat said that the cover of "Shut Up and Sing," my book from two thousand seven, <laughs> <laughs> where Laura is stepping out of her her brownstone no, in no, the no, village. No, 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 that's just power to the people. Oh, no, no, that's no, no, another no. bad that's power cover. To the I, tell I don't you. have it in this office. Oh I yeah, know. it's over here. Yeah, it's I over should, on the yeah, wall. Yeah. That, Pat, so I was like, you look like Florence Henderson and Wes and Allity. That's the worst cover of a book. And I look back, how did I even allow these book covers? They're the worst. That's the second worst. The wor- Power <laughs> of the People should have been like the Tea Party cover. What did I say at you the time? You did. I had a, Thank you. God bless my publisher. I love them very much. But they did not get what we were saying about the cover of Power to the People. It should have been the Tea Party. Power to the People looks like it. mom greeting the kids Hi. as the bus pulls up. Hey. <laughs> Hi, kids. She's got that beleaguered kind oh of look. Look, God. if you look closely you know at the face, I was Lord. in Greenwich Village, and I was. This was being shot in Greenwich Village, and I was so annoyed because this and thing went on. Oh no, no. And I, I wasn't there. I remember no, that no, I was you, supposed you, thanks, to be, but you didn't couldn't come. come. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so David Cassidy passed away, and all. Okay, I want to talk to all you gals of a per- particular age out there. I know you're getting ready for the turkey. Are you thaw- thawing the turkey? We're gonna. We're going to. Well. I mean, we'll talk about some Thanksgiving Day horror stories this hour. We have a, a whole bunch to get to, though. We, we're loaded up this whole show. Um, 
But we have a uh, we always have our Thanksgiving Day horror stories, which if we don't do it this hour, I'm afraid we won't do it at all. So eight five five forty Laura, funny stories, horror stories. I don't mean horror, death and destruction. I just mean funny mishaps on Thanksgiving because they always make me laugh. Uh, a lot of you are on the road. Be careful. Uh, Drudge had that horrific photo. Speaking of horror shows, of the traffic in L.A. last night. Mm. Raymond tweets out, "There is no meal worth this experience. There, there's no family. Me- there's no family reunion worth that experience in the Horrible. traffic. No, 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 no. Can't do it." Uh, and uh, David Cassidy, what was your favorite song? Why? I woke up in love this morning. So, Raymond, you're too young, so you you weren't part of the Partridge yeah. family. It was a, I never really it was liked a kitschy, the Partridge family. It was yeah, okay, it was a but... kitschy kind of. It was a kitschy kind of show, and that you know a lot of them got screwed up. Though Danny Bonaducci got into drugs, he turned his life around. Um, Susan Day, you know, I don't know really what happened to her. But yeah, it was just not. I, I don't yeah. know what it was. There was something that didn't appeal to me. You about didn't the like show. Reuben Kincaid? Hey, we got we got a big oh. problem here. No, he was a terrible. He's, he was he's, annoying. He's dead. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I like the Brady Bunch better. The Brady Bunch was more fun. I had a crush on Greg, Peter. And Bobby. I had a crush on all three, and the father. Maybe it was because they were vagabonds. I didn't like the idea of a family running around in a, a bus. bus. That didn't appeal to me no, at all. No, and it was a kind of a skanky... Uh, yeah, nasty Yeah, it was a time. nasty hippie bus. Yeah, it was horrible. Yeah, no. The, okay, let's, 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 let's throw dirt on the grave. All right, okay. okay. Well, that's I mean, really positive. Well, that's a very nice... I mean, he was... You know, his, I liked some of his songs. They're catchy. No, but, but he had yeah. that... So when I, was, when I was a kid in the late 70s, that look was very big. That look of the feathered hair, Sean, Sean Cassidy came after him, and his, right. uh, his brother, half-brother, I guess. Right. So Sean Cassidy, you know, the do-run-run, he was, he was the sort of the next big, it was Donny Osmond, David Cassidy, Sean Cassidy, you know. Leaf Garrett. Leaf Garrett, the DeFranco family singers. Oh, I'm really going into the, you are. Into the annals of, of, well, Tiger Beat. I remember it cost 99 cents to get Tiger Beat. My mother's like, what are you buying? And then there was 16 magazine. It was called 16. Obviously, these were long since gone. I remember going to uh, Pagano's Pharmacy in Glastonbury, Connecticut, or going to Franklin's Pharmacy, and they was like, oh. Uh, I, again, David Cassidy's a little – was, I was too young for the David Cassidy thing, but I was like, Leaf Garrett. It's so funny that because I have a 12-year-old daughter now. I'm like, boys are not for you until you're 18. I'm like – well, Mom, you know, if you forget the way you were when you were 12, you're like, gaga for boys. It's just hilarious. Anyway, rest in peace, David Cassidy. But gals of a certain age, you can call in. Did you like Brady Bunch or did you like Partridge Family better? And did you, and I mean this as a sincere question, did you have a life-size pinup on your bedroom door of David Cassidy? They had those... Yeah, they're almost life size. You know, you unfold them from the magazines, and it would be the special insert. Then you tack it up on your door. I mean, this was. This is, it just it brings you back. So it's another passing of a you know of of the time. Uh, Donald Trump was up early tweeting today. We'll get into that. Uh, apparently, Lavar Ball is uh, still getting under his skin. I, I think we've got to drop the Lavar Ball. We don't care. Um, a couple of other things we have to get to. We have new allegations of sexual harassment against. Well, it was Al Franken yesterday. We have uh, John Lasseter at Pixar. Yep. Uh, who, how many kids does he have? Five kids? I mean, he's a four or five, four or five kid, kids. Yeah. Uh, and I made the point yesterday, last night on the Ingram angle, that this is now, this is now becoming a one upsmanship on the part of the Me Too crowd. I'm sorry. It's now getting. You really need to have a sexual harassment hour where you just talk well, that to new all, accusers. That should be yeah. Hour. That should be just a whole hour on cable news. This is the sex harassment hour because otherwise you don't cover actual news. <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't get North Korea could be you know exploding San Francisco tomorrow. This just in, you know, another accuser in the Conyers case. Yeah, exactly. This this just in, a former writer for Vanity Fair apparently unzipped himself in front. You know, he, he just, it never ends. So just keep by the going. way, the Detroit Free Press yeah. has a, a column today. John Conyers must go. Well, I think that's unfair. I've only been in, I've only been in Congress for fifty-two years, Raymond. Fifty-five is my lucky number. Oh yeah. The man, we did an anger mangle last night on the dinosaurs of Congress, and, and, and it's back to the term limit idea, of course, which never seems to go anywhere. But when you add up the amount of time these old lumbering dinosaurs have been padding around Capitol Hill. Uh, sucking off the taxpayer's uh, teat. Uh, th- this is just now, uh, th- it's ridiculous. From Dianne Feinstein to to John Conyers to Louise Slaughter, to, 
These people are in their late 80s. Late 80s? 88 years old and they're still on the, in the Senate? Give someone else a try. And I know there's some people who will say, well, with age comes wisdom. Yeah, with age comes incontinence, too. <laughs> with age comes a lot of things. With age comes, you know, a, a, a losing brain uh, function. With, with age comes losing mobility. Yes, with age comes a lot. You do have great senators, and Hatch has done some great things. Grassley, I adore him. I, I mean, he did set up that stupid um, Com- accountability of compliance, compliance office, which was a mistake back in 95. But Grassley actually has listened to the people. And for the most part, on some things he hasn't, but Hatch has done a great job on judges and on tax reform. So you have some young young bucks who are a disaster, uh, who are just not listening to the people at all, like Jeff Flake is younger. He's maybe 55. And then you have you know Corey, Corey uh, Gardner in Colorado, who never liked Trump. And then you have Ben Sass, you know, pretty boy Sass, who's, you know, nightmarish. So they're younger. But again, do you agree with me that when you're 88 years old and you have been in Congress for 52 years, even even without these sexual harassment claims that you're paying out of your office budget like Conyers was, it's time to go. Mm. He was in office since 1965 when Lyndon B. Johnson was president. And as Raymond added, when Mary Poppins was released. <laughs> So it's time for him to go fly a kite up with. Yeah, it's time for him to go fly a kite. Time to leave. All right. Uh, we also have some other news. Um, this is what is it? We playing? We're playing uh, Donald Trump on Roy Moore. This is uh, Trump always gives these Q and A moments with reporters as he's as he's boarding Marine One with the helicopter sound in the background, the plane the background. or Air Force One, and so he's screaming over the uh, the. Chopper blades. Let's listen. Mr. President, is an accused child molester better than a Democrat? Is an accused well, child molester better look, than a Democrat? Well, he denies it. he denies it. I mean, if you look at what what is really going on, and you look at all the things that have happened over the last 48 hours, he totally denies it. He says it didn't happen. And, you know, you have to listen to him also. You're talking about, he said 40 years ago, this did not happen. Forty years ago, it did not happen, he said, which, of course, the left is running wild with because now they're saying it's basically in 2018, it's going to be the Trump more or more Trump, Trump more Republican Party sending women running for the exits. Now, Steve Schmidt on MSNBC, who is a virulent never Trumper, uh, former McCain campaign chief said this. Tragic day for the Republican Party. Uh, this is an accused child molester, credibly accused by multiple women. What we're talking about here is a 14-year-old little girl. He's unfit to serve in the United States Senate. This exposes a profound moral rot in the country, in the Republican Party, a great test for the citizens of the state of Alabama. Whoa, 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 whoa. A profound moral rot at the center of the Republican Party. How, does, does, is, does he have any acknowledgement of the fact that from the entertainment industry to the media industry recently and from politics, most of these people happen to be Democrats? It's a dark day for the Republican Party. Those are all Democrats. That's a dark day for the Republican Party. That's the soundbite we need to play after <laughs> that. Yeah, that's it's a dark day. Uh, this is Donald Trump's. This is Donald Trump's party of sexual harassment. Eight five five forty Laura. We have a lot to get to and um, Turkey uh, talk. Turkey hotline. Uh, we got We got. We got to talk about number one. Uh, is is Thanksgiving your favorite holiday and why? Number two, Thanksgiving mishaps. We want to hear them. And number three, you better DVR the Ingram Angle. We're on tonight. A lot of people aren't on tonight. Thanksgiving it's thank- Eve special. Thanksgiving Eve special. Trump and the age of gratitude. A very Ingram Thanksgiving. It's a very Ingram Thanksgiving. It's a, what was it, a very Osmond Christmas or a very... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, that's next month. Oh, no, that's right. We're going to get to that. All right, we'll take a break. 855 Laura. Let's go right to the lines. Thanksgiving Eve. We're all getting ready for the big uh, turkey day, gratitude. And we have a special on Fox tonight. Uh, Trump and the age of gratitude. What do we have to be grateful for in, with this president, this economy? Uh, the fact that we're not engaged in yet another war? 
uh, and the fact that uh, things are looking up. We have a great story we're going to get to on NAFTA, and even the Canadians seem to be turning around to Trump's view. You won't believe this story. Janine or Jean, Janine in Florida. Go ahead. Hi, I have a message for the um, people in Alabama that are on the fence about Judge Moore and anybody else that's on the fence about his integrity. Um, what That 14-year-old girl, when she was 14 years old, the lady 40 years later that's claiming this all happened, she's saying that her proof that this all happened is that she told her friends and family at the time. Okay, well, that's proof that it's a lie because... I know that if somebody would have told, I don't have any children, but if I would have a daughter and somebody told me the story that she's claiming, that he was alone with her in the car, he fondled her, tried to get to her, to yeah. take her clothes off and touch her private parts, yeah, yeah, yeah. Judge yep. Moore would be in jail or he right. would be dead. All right. I go. We got that comment. 855 laura Let's go to uh, B in Florida. Some people want to get off to the Roy Moore horror show and go on to Thanksgiving horror shows. B. Hi. Uh, well, what happened, this is my problem was with the turkey. My friend girl stuck the turkey with beer. The direction said beer for the fried turkey. So she stuck it up a beer can in the turkey butt, put it in the temperature, cooked it, the turkey blew up, and hit the neighbor <laughs> next door and knocked him out. <laughs> It Wait a was second! So embarrassing. What? She hey, B. Hey, B. B. Well, first of all, are, where are you from originally? With that accent. I, I am from Pensacola, Florida. Oh, okay, Pensacola, Florida. Put a beer can up up the rear end of the turkey or in the breast? Where'd you put it? All right, we'll take a break. We'll, I've got to continue with B on this story. Stay with us. Uh, this is Thanksgiving time. What are you grateful for? What are you uh, What are you most thankful for in a time of Trump? We'll be talking about that. We have a special tonight uh, for the Ingram Angle. Uh, we had a huge reaction to the angle last night, my call for these octogenarians who've been in Congress for 30 and 40 years to step aside, in the case of John Conyers, 50 years. And also I raised the question of whether we are dumbing down real sexual harassment and lowering the bar for real criminal behavior and chilling workplace relations to the extent that no one's going to want to say anything to anyone. And you're going to have to multiple witnesses in every room. We had a uh, we had a caller yesterday who told us that he has cameras everywhere in his sales force, in the sales room, everywhere except the bathroom and the conference room where he has private meetings and it's a glass room. So nobody can ever claim anything. It's a glass room. And he says, I have that there now to protect me and, frankly, the employees from any wrongful accusations. And now, everybody, you're being recorded. Just know it. That's, that's how bad it is today. Uh, also, your Thanksgiving horror stories, mishaps. We don't want terrible stories, but mishaps. You look back and you laugh. I shared, uh, I shared some over the last uh, couple of days of things that happened when I was a kid. And it just, the, the, it's funny that the fun times, they stay with you, but the mishaps are the things you really remember. Because at the time, you're like, oh, I can't believe I'm going through this. But in retrospect, unless someone is seriously injured, it's really fun. Now, B is still on the line. And B, I just have to paint this picture for, for my listeners. I have never heard of this strategy of cooking a turkey where you put a beer can in the cavity. But when you guys were – when you, was you guys cooking it, your relative cooking it, you decided you were going to keep the beer in the can? Is that what happened? No, what it was, the recipe called, is called a drunken turkey. Drunken turkey. turkey. is called a drunken beer turkey. That's what it called. And what it was, she read the wrong direction. It said inject the turkey with beer. She put the beer can in it <laughs> and, and tied the legs together and put it in the deep fry of 400 cc. When she dropped the turkey in there, we were just gathered around this talking, you know, everybody doing what they're supposed to be doing. All of a sudden, something, shh, boom, and the turkey flew over. And we look up, the turkey flew over next door and knocked the poor man in the head. <laughs> the turkey was, and I mean, it was so embarrassing until we ran. Everybody ran next door. The man was laying out. His poor little wife was doing laundry. So she called him. He was out, the turkey on top of his head. Had put a dent in his head. 
<laughs> and it was so embarrassing. And I said, oh, my God, we getting sued. I mean, it was everything going through my mind. She knocked this poor man completely out with that turkey. <laughs> okay. This almost sounds... I, now, you are not pulling my turkey leg here. This is a real story. No, I am not. And I hope she not listening to this because she'll kill me. Because it was so, it was so embarrassing. And I, we was, when she read the direction, it says, stuff it with beer. It's supposed to have been injected with the beer. Right. Oh, she tore the beer out, out and okay. injected. So you inject it with beer and the turkey, which I have never heard yeah. before. So, yeah. but she decided to put the whole can in. And what, okay, and, and B, speak up really loudly because I want to hear what you're saying. So, if you could estimate how far the turkey actually flew, like through the trajectory of the turkey, what would you estimate that it was? 50 yards, 25 yards? Was it a two point conversion? What was it? I think it was 25 yards because when we looked up, we heard an explosion. We looked up, the turkey had flew out. And my goodness, everybody laughed, but when I heard something say, ah, bam, it hit him dead off in the head. <laughs> and it was burnt. His head, his forehead had burnt. Oh, and uh, <laughs> everybody ran over next door, and uh, it was just terrible. It was horrible. We had to really terrible. get him, like, yes. I mean, he was he was combated in the head. He was just, it was, it was crazy. Okay. And see, they had been drinking anyway. Oh, they've been drinking. Oh, they already been drinking. Thank God they've been drinking. <laughs> Otherwise, he could be dead. That's right. He could be dead. Okay, if he was, if he hadn't been drinking, he might have gotten real cold cocked. But how long did it take for him yeah, to come well, to af- after he was hit? Well, what had happened, his wife didn't know what was going on. She heard the noise. She ran to the back of her husband laying out the turkey on top of his head. <laughs> and uh, she going, what, what in the world? You know what? That's crazy. So all of us were trying to get a story together. And what had happened, that, that beer, what, when it had got really, really hot, the kilowatts of it getting hot, that's what made the explosion. The kilowatts did the explosion. Oh, Unbelievable. The kil- oh, no, no, no. B- this, is, B, this has to be the yeah. greatest Thanksgiving no, horror no. story B- ever. B, I have heard a lot of stories, but I think over 16 years of radio, I've had I heard just the, the hilarity never ends. I have never heard a story funnier than that. So all weekend long. Get her address. We need to send B, B something B, for I'll, Christmas. Yeah, stay on hold. I'm going to send you a copy of Billionaire at the Barricades, which you're going to love. It's a, it's awesome. You're going to love the book. And you stay on hold. I'm going to send it to you with a little uh, with a photo and, and uh, a reference to your funny turkey story, okay? Oh, thank you so much. And wh- who's cooking the turkey today for you or tomorrow for you? Who's cooking it? Well, what's the sad part about it? My mom and dad both died the day before Thanksgiving, oh. and it's like a little, it's like a, a bunch of memories to me. Yeah, but, I know. It. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of hard. So you, I got to get out of that mold, but be by myself. No, no, you can't be by yourself. No, you I'll probably you gotta... go to the beach. I probably ride to the beach or something like that and come back home. Well, I wish uh, I wish I was going to be in Pensacola because guess who'd be coming to my dinner is you. Because B, you sound like an r- absolute riot, and uh, and, I, and I don't want you to be by yourself on Thanksgiving. That's ridiculous. So, and we're praying for you and your family. I yeah. know it's hard when you lose. Yeah, loved my, ones my mother lost holidays. her mother on Easter Sunday, and she was always sad on Easter Sunday because her mother died when she was fourteen or in the, in, during the Depression. So my mother always had a hard time on Easter because of that, because it's just that memory of losing her parent. Mm-hmm. Her, you know, she loved her mother so. So we completely uh, we completely get it. But B, thank you for listening to the show, and and you call in anytime, okay? And stay on hold because I want to send thank you this. Stay, stay on hold. Eight five five forty Laura. Uh, we have a lot more to get to on the Laura Ingram show, including some great news on the economy. Uh, jobless claims again fall as uh, this record run in the in the stock market and. Overall economic confidence in the country, it just doesn't seem like it could. You see, you're saying, oh, well, sexual harassment claims are never going to end. I mean, at some point, this economic run is going to end, but I hope it doesn't happen anytime soon. But this is unbelievable. It could be the best Christmas, you know, the, the buying season of Christmas for retailers that we've had in many years. Christmas bonuses, on average, are jumping 66% to $1,797. 
mm. in, in a booming economy. This is the fi- top 500 corporations anticipating a massive 66 percent increase in the economy. I mean, this is great news. President Trump has got to get some credit for this. I mean, they say, "Oh, he has nothing to do with it." Oh, okay. Well, it's easy to talk about Roy Moore. And- yeah, it's, oh, that's uh, that's what they want to talk about is Roy Moore. They don't want to talk about any of the good, uh, any of the good stuff. And there's this piece that uh, I've just. Uh, sent around. I'm not, I got to make sure that I've actually posted it. But there was a great piece about NAFTA in the Toronto Star that almost it it literally almost just knocked my socks off. It says, "Believe it or not, on NAFTA, Donald Trump makes sense, but this mo- most unlikely ally of can- of can- the Canadian left gets no credit." There's a piece by Tom Walcom in the Toronto Star. And he says, when it comes to the North American free trade agreement, much of what Donald Trump makes sense. I know it's unpopular in Canada to say this, but Trump is usually portrayed here as a dangerous loon whose protectionist views risk throwing the world back into recession or worse. But during the latest round of NAFTA talks this week, Mexican and Canadian negotiators treated core U.S. proposals as so stupid they refused to even discuss them. But instead, as the Canadian press reported, they insisted that the American side explain in detail how its plans would work uh, in the hope that the Socratic exercise would allow it to see the error of its own ways. Uh, and it went on. But it said, in fact, I suspect skilled trade ne- negotiators could draft regulations as to which auto parts are deemed North American without knowing anything about dinosaurs. The essential point is that Trump's negotiators in these three-way talks between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico want autos that have been accorded the privilege of moving duty-free throughout North America to be substantially manufactured in this continent. To that end, they would raise the minimum North American content in automobiles from 62.5% to 85%. That is good news for all of North America. And these big car companies, you know, they say, oh, this is far too high. They want to get more component parts from Asia and so forth. But for North American auto and steel workers, higher content rules will be a huge benefit. Uh, It goes on and on. I'll make sure this is posted on lauraingram.com as well. Terrific piece. All right, we'll take a break. Again, we're going to close out this hour. Your best Thanksgiving horror stories. Keep them pithy. Keep them short. Uh, And Trump, more good news on the economy. We'll explore this tonight. Gratitude in the Age of Trump, a special on the Fox News Channel, 10 p.m. Eastern. Remember, Billionaire at the Barricades, get your copy, bring it to Thanksgiving, give it as a hostess gift. You'll love the book. It explains how we got here and how Trump can end up becoming and being one of the best presidents we've had in the United States for the last 50 years. Don't go away. I don't know why they need a teleprompter when they're pardoning turkeys. I think they should just... Make a few jokes and get out of there. They seem to have to teleprompter for a turkey party. I don't get that. It's silly. Uh, let's go to Keith in North Carolina. Thanksgiving horror stories. Keith. Hey, how are you doing, Laura? Great. Happy Thanksgiving. Same to you. Um, when I was like seven or eight, my stepfather's brother was in a prison, and he was on the kitchen detail cooking Thanksgiving dinner for the prisoners. And it was late at night. Well, my stepfather pulled up to the the great big fence behind the prison kitchen. His brother was throwing frozen turkeys over the fence. My stepfather would catch it, hand it to me, and make me run and throw it in the trunk of the car. Wait so we were stealing turkeys from the prison. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's okay. That's the that's pretty low. So how did you catch yeah. each turkey that was thrown over the fence? That's my. Was it a minimum security yeah. deal or what? Uh, it was late at night. I guess it was. My stepfather would catch the turkey, and I was like seven or eight, and he'd hand it to me and tell me to run and throw it in the trunk of his car. To, to catch the turkey and run. So did you end up playing football after that experience? Because it sounds <laughs> like you're running down the field with a with a turkey ball or butter ball turkey. That's a great story. I appreciate it. Happy Thanksgiving. Let's go to Greg in California. This is one of my favorite times. By the way, we're going to talk to a woman from AAA who's going to give us the lowdown on a traffic situation nationwide. Uh, you're not going to want to miss that. And the refugee crisis uh, this November in Italy and throughout Europe. And what we need uh, to take away is lessons here in the United States when we consider our own refugees. Uh, that's coming up and a lot more Ingram Angle special on gratitude in the age of Trump. Uh, you're not going to want to miss that. So DVR us and billionaire at the barricades. Let's go to Keith. Uh, excuse me, Greg in California. Greg, go ahead. 
Yeah, good morning, Laura. Love the show. Hey, Thank um, you. Yeah, so about two years ago, you're welcome. Um, about two years ago, me and my brother went and played golf on Thanksgiving, and we came back in to my parents' house. And them being retired, you know, they go on walks around here on the central coast of California every morning. And they have to take a little protection with them. They had this cylindrical-type can sitting on the buffet. So my brother walks in not knowing what it was. Like, he thought it was Banaka or something. I don't know what was going through his mind. Yeah. But he picks it up, and he sprays it. And as he starts to spray it, my mom screams at him, no! And it was it ended up being pepper spray. Ah! And he drops it, and the tip drops off. And the whole thing just bombed the whole house with pepper spray. And this is at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon where, like, the church is almost done. So we had to evacuate the house for about two and a half hours. Did you, get hit, with any the pepper, did you get hit with any of the pepper spray? Oh, yeah. That stuff is just immediately on contact. just burns your face. It burned everybody's face because you had to walk through it. And then oh. you couldn't go in the house for about two hours. Did, but it didn't it add a little extra special spice to the turkey that Thanksgiving? Admit it. It really. There was. A, there's a, <laughs> there a little something extra. Oh my god! That that is okay. That's the second best story so far. The show. First was the beer can turkey that sent the turkey flying 25 yards, knocked the neighbor out, knocked him almost date. I love how she said. She sounds like New Orleans, Raymond. Date B knocked him date. It's cold, knocked out date. It looked like date. Uh, they, there's no D at the end of the word. I love that accent. That is my, one of my favorite accents. And, and Keith, Keith and Greg have great stories, too. This is awesome. All right. We've got a lot more to get to on the Laura Ingram Show. The refugee crisis throughout Europe. Uh, we have a satire Thanksgiving song for people. P- people apparently had too much time on their hands. And if you're on the road, be careful. Do not text and drive. Stay alert and listen to the show. We'll keep you laughing all, uh, all show long. Remember, Ingram Angle tonight. Tune in. Are you going shopping? Did you forget? Tell me you didn't forget the pumpkin pie stuffing. And don't tell me that you mashed up the, your own pumpkins. You do, don't even tell me you did that. If you kept them from, if you kept them from a Halloween, I bet they're going to taste really good. Now you have to use the little cooking pumpkins, the small ones. The big ones are too tough. Uh, but the, uh, the story about this, uh, this refugee crush in Italy keeps getting worse and worse. And by the way, it's. It's why Europe's Merkel and France's Macron are and, and Theresa May are less popular today than Trump. His approval ratings, the, the Washington Examiner reminds us, are always mocked. They're mocked by Democrats, mocked by the media, so low. And But you look at the big three, Germany's Merkel, France's Macron, and UK's uh, Theresa May, and... They're lousy. They have lousy favorability ratings. Yeah, very favorable. When, yeah, a new Zogby Analytics survey, those people in the countries also find the disapproval ratings are sky high. Citizens of France, Germany, and UK are not happy with the Macron, Merkel, and May. The three M's is the poll headline. A majority of adults in France, UK, uh, dislike Macron in May. Nearly half of the adults in Germany dislike Merkel. I was talking to a, a German businessman recently, and he told me that Merkel has just stayed too long. She's been in office too long, and she was initially, and she is, I mean, on on economic issues, she's actually really smart. Germany has the strongest economy in Europe. Germany's unemployment is still very low. She made the big mistake with the refugees. Huge, huge mistake. So Trump's approval rating has been, uh, in the range from 38% to mid-40s. Rasmussen set it at 42% this week. But the approval rating for Merkel is is 40%, Macron 28 and May 28. So all things considered, Trump's not doing too bad. That's what I say. And speaking of the refugee disaster, and you heard that soundbite that we played coming in, uh, the problem in Italy grows worse and worse and worse. This Wall Street Journal piece uh, this week, the title is Italy Struggles to Absorb Refugees. Italy is facing a daunting challenge integrating refugees, even as the pace of seaborne arrivals on its shores show signs of slowing. Since 2012, 150,000 people have one refugee status in Italy, and another 155,000 applications are pending. 
Other European countries, Germany, Sweden, are wrestling with the same task, but Italy is doing so with a chronically weak economy. High unemployment and a state bureaucracy that often fails to provide a social safety net for native-born Italians. And many refugees lack marketable skills, officials and aid groups say. It's a challenge that makes your hands shake, said Domenico Manzion, the Undersecretary of the Interior for, uh, for Immigration in Italy. The Italian government approved the country's first ever plan for integrating refugees in late September. And the plan sets out general priorities such as providing Italian lessons, work training and housing to people who obtain the right to live and work in the country, but doesn't spell out how Italy will achieve these goals. Italy has so far concentrated largely on providing emergency food, shelter, and basic support with non-governmental organizations, especially the Catholic Church. But a patchwork of existing efforts, often in the private sector to assimilate refugees, falls well short of meeting existing needs. Italy focused a lot on the reception and first care of the refugees, forgetting about their integration, said the president of a Jesuit refugee service. Um, Now integration is the weakest link. So Italy basically saw very little immigration until the early 90s, but hundreds of thousands of migrants have arrived in the country in recent years, most of them traveling by boat across the Mediterranean. So the number of seaborne arrivals in Italy has dropped significantly since July. About 114,000 have arrived in 2017 compared to 180,000 for all of last year. If we can control the numbers of people arriving, we can integrate them better, said one of the other government ministers. Previous waves of migrants included many individuals, often women with education and work experience that allowed them to find employment relatively quickly. Those people, many from North Africa and Eastern Europe, relied on networks within their national and ethnic groups to find housing. By contrast, check this out. Only about 16 percent of migrants in recent years have a high school degree. And 10 percent are illiterate. According to a 2016 survey. About 80% of our African men and similar percentage are under 30. So you have 80% of the hundreds of thousands of refugees are African men, and they're under the age of 30. They're overwhelmingly Islamic. State resources are stretched so thin that Italian citizens often wait years for public housing, and many refugees are forced to squat in abandoned buildings. These people find themselves in devastating situations. Amadou Wahabu, 32, a refugee from Togo, found a night job as a security guard in a betting parlor in Rome a year ago. That, that meant he was no longer entitled to stay in the migrant center that had sheltered, sheltered him. Unable to afford housing, he slept for two months at Rome's Termini train station. Finally, he was admitted to a church program. His neighbor, Osman Dubaizi, 25, a Gambian refugee, is in the same church program. I worry a lot about the future, he said. I'm fighting every day to have a better life. Well, you, your heart breaks for the refugees, but Italy will be forever changed. Europe is forever changed. Refugees need to be helped, if at all possible, in their home regions, where they are most comfortable, where they are most you know, most suited to have a better life. And the problem is, is the U.N. refugee camps are all, frankly, infiltrated by ISIS. These are disastrous situations. And people, you know, people like uh, Merkel, who thought, you know, we could bring in three million people. I mean, you've got to game this out. You got to You got to game it out down the road. OK, what does that mean for life in Europe in 20 years? What does that mean for our values of religious liberty, respect for women, respect for our principles of that are more egalitarian. What, can these people ever meld into that system? Is it possible? And not a lot of thinking seemed to go into that. By the way, in that Greek island of Lesbos, um, it's now considered a migrant prison because a lot of these uh, these refugees that are there are 
You know, there, there's a lot of crime, there are rapes, there's, there's huge problems. And, you know, they, what can we say? I mean, Europe, this, it's a horrible situation. People arrive in these big, these boats and they're ready to collapse and these women and children are starving and you get to help them. But there's, there really needs to be a plan to return them to their homelands. That's what the plan should be. It should not be they permanently resettle in Europe. That is not feasible. And the integration, as we can see from these examples, is not possible. 855-40-LAURA. Uh, we'll take a break. Your reaction to all of this. Also traveling this holiday. You can continue to share your horror stories with me. That's fine. I'm, I'm leaving town in, I don't know, six or seven hours, six hours, I guess, uh, on a plane. So I'm going to be going into the airport, but I'm um, not looking forward to it, but it's okay. And my children and I, so we're going to travel for this holiday season. And I hope you all are, get some, get a belly full of turkey or whatever it is that uh, floats your boat and that you are with people that you really love. That's the most important thing. All right, we'll take a break. Stay with us. A, a San Diego man is recovering after being seriously injured climbing Yosemite's Half Dome earlier this month. This had, this had not made the papers. Alex Doria told ABC 10 KGTV that his foot slipped, sending him tumbling 50 feet down the sheer Half Dome cliff. Half Dome is one of the, the places that climbers, free climbers, and uh, the best climbers in the world go to practice their craft. So he fell 50 feet down this granite face. And it's this is iconic. This whole vista is iconic. You see it in all the books. He fell. When he fell, he broke his back, his foot, his wrist, one wrist and ribs. Now, a friend went down and tended to him after he fell. And they arrived. They evacuated him to uh, the local hospital. But they said that had he fallen like an inch differently in the way his impact hit the hit the granite on granite that he would have been fully paralyzed and or dead broken his neck can you i mean i i mean i read this I mean, this has to be a joke half dome is like one of the this is just you fall in half dome you're dead i mean there's no wonder what your wonder what your life thinking is after you fall and survive something like that do you are you one of those people who just said, I got to get back to Half Dome and Dome and do that dumb free climbing? Or he must have been free climbing. I know there's not much more to the story, but I just saw that and I thought, boy, lucky. Don't tell me that Starbucks is in a holiday cup controversy again. I said last year I wasn't going to go to Starbucks anymore after the holiday cup. I said, I'm not going to Starbucks. Of course, I broke my vow. I would go to Starbucks. Now the cups are being. Oh, yeah, they're being screened and scanned because they've had, they had these cups for years, for 20 years. And now Christians don't believe they show enough respect for Christianity at Christmas. And this year's cup does feature nods to the Christmas tradition, including a decorated Christmas tree, which, of course, is not a religious symbol, but better than nothing, and was introduced by an online video that proclaimed the holidays mean something different to everyone. But their big tent approach wasn't enough to avoid controversy. This year, critics wonder if Starbucks is using its holiday cups to promote homosexuality. What? The online video that was in introduced the 2017 holiday cup featured a diverse cast of Starbucks customers, including a pair of cartoon women who were shown holding hands. Okay, James is watching it. It's all music, so you can't, it doesn't work for radio. The linked hands came to a wider public attention after BuzzFeed published an article about them on Wednesday. It suggested the cup was totally gay. BuzzFeed is just desperately looking for clicks, let's face it. But if if really, I mean, if your biggest problem in the course of the build up to Christmas, I mean, we haven't even done Thanksgiving yet, is 
the holiday cup at Starbucks, then I, I suggest your priorities really need to be reexamined at this point. I'm just glad when anyone says Christmas anymore. I mean, when people say happy holidays to me, I always shoot back, Merry Christmas. I Season's greetings. If I get a Christmas card that says season greetings, it just, it enrages me. Something about season's greetings. It's that phrase I can't stand. No, it's Christmas. We're not celebrating the fact that it's December 21st, four days later. We're not celebrating the fact that it's cold. We're celebrating the birth of Christ. And if you don't celebrate the birth of Christ, that's fine. But for the most part, people know that I'm Christian. So just say Merry Christmas to me. Like I say Happy Hanukkah. Are people still doing Kwanzaa? It it seems like it's not a – that never really did catch on. I mean, that was just kind of a made-up holiday, right? That was just conceived of – kind of a made up deal but but whatever you want to celebrate solstice whatever but i want to i'm saying merry christmas and my friends by the way most of my friends who are jewish they have no trouble getting christmas cards that say merry christmas they're not offended by it they don't care a lot of them put up christmas trees they just don't care they celebrate their holidays we celebrate ours but my goodness we've gotten to the point of of uber political correctness that I, I just think people are fed up. They're fed up. They don't want to hear it anymore. They want to enjoy time with their families. And yes, it's a religious holiday. E- it's Easter break for us. It's not spring break. I'm I'm holding on to all my old traditions. Okay, from the food to what we call it to the type of card I send out. Oh, how about the tyranny of the Christmas cards? Having to send cards out. I swore last year I'm not going to do it this year because it ends up being stressed because I lose the labels or they don't print out right or I forget people. People move. Then they all come back. And in February, I'm still getting return to sender cards because I sent sent it to the wrong address. It it becomes in and of itself another added stress to the season. But don't even think of sending me an e-card. The e-cards? No. And then it keeps reminding you, you haven't opened your e-card. Good, because I'm never going to. I'm never going to open your e-card. So do not send me one with a dog with the red scarf and the snow falling. Jackie Lawson cards. Sorry, Chuck. Chuck sends me. Chuck, you are. if Chuck is listening, you're the only one I want to get an electronic card from. Because Chuck's in California, and I miss him and Ina dearly. But he loves the Jackie Lawson cards with the yellow lab on them. And they'll eat. You click, and then a dog dances. But other than Chuck, nobody else can send me an e-card. And do not say, have a joyous holiday either. I don't want any of that. Either Christmas card or just I'm fine with nothing. Okay, at this point. Uh, Joining us now, and it's that kind of time of year, and we always have fun. Uh, Nicole Johnson is a Butterball Turkey expert at the Butterball Turkey talk line that is jammed this time of year where people are trying to get their act together. A lot of uh, new couples having their first Thanksgiving together and are entertaining for the first time. I love those stories. So, you know, a poor young gal who's never cooked a turkey in her life, so I always had mom do it. Oh, sorry, that's sexist. Mom or dad do it. Uh, And she's freaking out. She doesn't know what to do. And uh, Nicole joins us now. Nicole, how you doing, girl? What's going on? I'm good, Laura. Oh, my gosh. We are in queue. We are talking turkey, whether it's on the phone whether it's email, chat, yeah. Facebook, of course, is super popular. Um, and I like your story. We get phone calls like that, whether it's a new bride, whether it's someone preparing their first Thanksgiving meal. Yeah. Um, it, it brings back a story. When I started the talk line about 17 years ago, and the lady's whispering on the phone, I'm thinking, ma'am, I can't hear you. I need you to speak up. Well, come to find out, she was doing her first Thanksgiving. She was a newlywed by a couple months. She had her in-laws in the dining room, and she didn't know how to test for doneness, and she was embarrassed. So she's hiding in her coat closet, hence the reason why she's whispering. She didn't want anyone to hear her. So we get those kind of phone calls all the time. It's never a dull moment here. <laughs> I, have, I have myself a question. Okay. There's always this debate that it rages this time of year. And, and at Christmas, it's the live versus fake tree debate that we have, Raymond and Arroyo and I have every year. It's, it's a classic knockdown drag out about whether a live tree or a fake tree is better. So that's one debate. But at Thanksgiving, it's... It's fresh turkey, frozen turkey, or regular turkey, organic turkey. Now, what, what, where do we come down on that? I know Butterball is a brand that we've, you know, we used to always get Butterball turkeys growing up, and they were the, mm, 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 they were good. I <laughs> good, mean, and my mom hear. just, yeah, she made those <laughs> Butterballs, and oh, that was good, really good. Good. But, that, good, what, good. but what is it, what is it, is it the fresh versus the frozen, I mean, 
Uh, does it really matter at this point? I mean, just eat the turkey. Is it, does you know, it matter that much? It really does, and it's just personal preference. When it comes to the fresh versus the frozen, they're both delicious options. The main difference is whether or not you want to spend the time thawing it or not. Fresh is already going to come from your grocer's refrigerator to your home refrigerator fully thawed. So if you're a working mom like myself, I have four little butter balls at home, I like to go with the fresh. I don't have to trouble with the thawing process. Um, it's, you know, it's personal preference. It really is. Well, I think that, as I remember, my mom used to keep that, that frozen turkey was in our sink. She'd have it in the sink in water. Smart. Smart. Yeah, and she saw that thing. You could have dropped that thing. You could have yeah. dropped that thing from 40,000 feet and taken out a whole village and the <laughs> Vietnam War. That thing was big and it was heavy. But and she solid. just she yeah, she saw thawed that thing out and I never noticed any big difference. We're going to open up the calls 855-40 Laura questions for the turkey expert on uh, Nicole Johnson at the Butterball Turkey Hotline 855-40 Laura. Nicole, I have an important question for you of my own. For the stuffing, which is my favorite because of course it's the stuff that's probably the worst for you but i think it's important to have giblet stuffing my mother took the giblets out and a lot of people forget you got to take them out of the cavity yeah she took the giblets out and she we we had our own meat grinder and so she ground the meat she she clamped it to the you know the old uh formica countertop we had and she ground the giblets and she made that with pepperidge farm uh uh, breadcrumbs and all the spices that uh, that stuffing. Yes. So My good. mom, that's her secret recipe, too. And oh. she never told me that for years. And she swears that's what gives her stuffing. Sometimes she even uses it for gravy, but she oh. swears by those giblets. And she that's her claim to fame. So I'm in the yeah. same boat. And we carry on that tradition with our little guys, too. Yeah, and I do, I do the giblets. You know, when I do a chicken, like a big chicken. Some people do chicken for Thanksgiving. They just like chicken, but I, I, I do the turkey. But the, the giblets, when you cook them, if you cook them and you have dogs... Oh my God! Those dogs—they start going like pacing the kitchen. They want those giblets. My they junkyard, know what's coming. yeah, my junkyard dog and hellhound. Those want—they want those giblets. They're pacing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So watch out for the dogs when you're doing the giblet stuffing. That's all I can say because they want those giblets, just like primal. They want the organs. They want the uh, the heart, the kidney. The, they want all that. Um, they want so the uh, the other question I have is the timing. A lot of people have trouble with the timing of the turkey because they cook the turkey they don't have they they simply do not have the the timing down for the side dishes and then the mashed potatoes invariably which a lot of people don't eat it's one of my favorite things the mashed potatoes but the mashed potatoes get cold and they nothing tastes good if the timing is wrong how do you manage the timing on your end sure well we do recommend that you you know give us a call and we're going to ask you what size turkey you have So let's say, for example, you have a turkey that weighs between 18 to 22 pounds. Let's say that he's stuffed because I've always stuffed in our household. It's how my family's done it. We carry on tradition. So an 18 to 22 pound stuffed turkey is four and a half to five hours. So we like for folks to use this range. Ideally, if you use your meat thermometer, check for doneness, 180 in the thigh, 170 in the breast. But to your point, if it is done earlier than your other side dishes or, you know, maybe earlier than, you know, when your guests arrive, you can go ahead and take the turkey out of the oven. And from a food safety perspective, it is okay to go ahead and wrap the entire turkey with some heavy aluminum foil Mm -hmm. and then even a bath towel that's going to help to maintain the heat and the moisture for up to two hours, believe it or not, before your guests arrive. So that's a definite uh, little tip there. And and finally, before we let you go, the, the browning of the turkey. Now, this is something I've done two different ways. On the one hand, you want, I like a crispy uh, skin on the outside. I love a crispy skin. I've never brined a turkey, which people swear by brining the turkey. They swear by it. I have never done the brining, but I, I want to try it. Um, but the, the, uh, the crispy brown skin, it looks beautiful. I think it tastes better. It keeps seals in those juices. What is key to accomplishing that? You know, you just want to go ahead and you don't want to dry out the skin, though, either. Um, you do brush the skin lightly with some vegetable oil prior to roasting it. But yep. I love using my convection bake 
option or for folks uh-huh. who even have a full-size convection oven, it's 20 to 25% less time, and it's going to give you that beautiful golden brown turkey. But that's what's really cool about the talk line. There's 50 of us manning the phones and emails. There's more than just a traditional way of cooking your turkey. A lot of times we're going to get a phone call where someone's oven's not calibrated correctly. Mm-hmm. People are without power, you know, depending on where they live with the weather. Aww. And so all of our experts are trained on different ways. There's nothing better than somebody calling, they're without power, and we ask them, do you have a barbecue grill? Do you have a charcoal grill outside? And they said, well, well yeah, I do. Well, guess what? You can go ahead and you can cook that turkey on the grill. Oh, they're, they're like overjoyed. You know, their Aww. Thanksgiving meal is not going to be ruined. Those are the real good calls we get. Uh, we got, we got a call for you. Steve in Florida, a uh, question for the turkey hotline, uh, Butterball Turkey Hotline. Steve, go ahead, my friend. Hi, Laura. I'm um, just curious. First time ever cooking a turkey. To, I'm getting conflicting reports how to thaw the turkey and the best way to season it. For First time ever. I've never done this before. Okay, Nicole, take it away. Okay, yeah, great question. Um, thawing, have you started thawing your turkey already in the refrigerator? I did, but it's still hard, rock, hard as a rock. Yes, <laughs> it, you better believe it. And you know why? Because it takes 24 hours or a whole day for every four pounds of turkey meat to thaw in your fridge. So depending on your turkey, it's going to take four or five days. What? Um, four yeah, or five days? You have a frozen turkey. You're out of luck. Tick tock. But that's okay, though, Laura, because then you can opt for your mom's way of cold water bath method. She was spot oh. on. It's a half hour per pound. So oh, okay. all is so, not lost. Go ahead and use your mom's method. She's, she's right on there. <laughs> okay. So, Steve, does that answer your question? So you, you, can, so you can bath it. it. My, my, you can bathe it in the, in the cold water, not hot water. You don't want to put hot water on the turkey, cold water, and let it sit in a big tub basically before you take a bath yourself I, don't take a bath with the turkey just let the turkey get right. thawed i do recall my mom doing it that way so i'm going to try that absolutely okay and okay. put some butter Thanks, butter guys. yeah butter and olive oil you know you gotta you gotta baste it with butter and olive oil but but nicole you don't want to keep opening closing opening and closing the oven correct you sure don't it's gonna allow no. that hot air to and it can actually increase your cook time forget um, it so try to avoid that Nicole, I could call, talk to you all day. You're just fun. And I hear all those chirpers in the background. They're already on the turkey talk line. And I hear them all. My gosh, it's like a telethon over there. That's fun. Well, we all work Thanksgiving Day, too. I mean, obviously Aww. that's our busiest day. So anybody wants to call us, you know, that's what we're here for. Nicole Johnson, expert at the Butterball Turkey Talk Line. So much fun to talk to you. And so many different ways to cook, cook a turkey. It didn't take me long to find this mashup that uh, these folks did on YouTube. And I've got to say, it's so stupid that it's actually funny. So they did a mashup for Thanksgiving 2017. Uh, they have obviously a parody of you know the song Chandelier, Sia, and Despacito. And I'm, and I'm finding myself watching this. You want to know why I don't go on YouTube? Because when I do, I watch stuff like this, and I find it really stupid stupidly funny and then i find myself having lost three and a half minutes that i'll never get back again but it is funny come on you gotta laugh you're in traffic right now you're ready to face the in-laws okay you really don't want to be there the turkey will be dried out you'll be forced to eat the mashed potatoes that you don't like the cranberry sauce is out of a can okay the stuffing is is dry as a bone you're gonna choke on it practically but you're gonna have to smile and say mmm this is great and as you spit it out in your napkin go to the bathroom and throw it out that's what you all are gonna have to do okay the smart people are the ones who go to a restaurant then they just then they just eat and leave let someone else clean it up okay i always feel bad for the people working on thanksgiving but it's interesting uh the folks who if i've i think i've i don't think i've ever gone out to a restaurant on i don't think i ever have on on thanksgiving but you know you go to the gas station you have to go to the pharmacy for something and it's usually the people who are working they they have to choose one holiday to work they either christmas or thanksgiving and people usually are tend to be very much nicer to merchants and store workers and gas station attend, attend, attendants during the holidays. And I always like to tip them. They're like, well, we don't take tips. I'm like, you're going to take this tip because you're working on – I just throw money at them. like, good for you for working. God, God bless you. And Threatening they, they just, gratuity. Yeah, they like, they like the idea of working – and getting, they get extra time. They usually get time and a half on Thanksgiving, and they might miss their family, but many can get home for some type part of the meal. So we always are grateful for the first responders, for the police and the hospital workers, those who work in the elderly facilities. It's not easy, and it's. And I also think about the elderly who are, you know, in wheelchairs, and you know they're parked in these hallways, and maybe their family is doesn't come visit them, and. You know, anything you can do to make someone's life brighter on on Thanksgiving, please do it because so many of us are very, very blessed and 
and uh, it's 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 not easy for everybody. It's it's a fun holiday, but not for everybody. You got to think of those those people as well. There was a piece in the New York Times I meant to get to uh, yesterday called "Feeling Conflicted on Thanksgiving," and it's about a guy named Viet Than Nguyen, uh, and he said, you know, he's a he's a father, and so he's reevaluating everything, and. He has a two-year-old son, so that's all nice. And he said uh, his school was already t- was teaching him in his little preschool about the myth about the pilgrims and Indians that this uh, author had learned, the myth. And I wanted h- to give him alternatives. Do you know what Thanksgiving means, I asked him. Yes. He thought about a word I had taught him. Genocide. Some readers will condemn me for being politically a politically correct killjoy. Other readers are thinking, go back to Vietnam. But what's wrong with saying that Thanksgiving is about genocide as much as it is about gratitude? History in America are contradictory and ambiguous. And yes, four-year-olds who are capable of being racist and sexist should be exposed to some of that ambiguity as a form of inoculation. Take the Thanksgiving meal. While the turkey does not find this meal to be an ambiguous experience, it is for people like me, refugees from Vietnam and survivors of a war that killed three million Vietnamese people. Generally, we're thankful we're in America and not in Vietnam, where we wouldn't be free to say words like genocide or to contradict propaganda as we do here. But some of us are not so thrilled about eating that turkey. Preparing it and eating it doesn't bring warm and fuzzy memories. The turkey is instead a strange bird to cook correctly, not to mention of its alien accompaniments like stuffing, mashed potatoes, and cranberry sauce. My parents, nonetheless, heroically attempted to provide our family with these ritualistic offerings. This is a downer of a piece. Nowadays, when we gather for Thanksgiving, my brother and sister-in-law bring a prepared turkey and fixings meal from a fancy supermarket. My father supplements this with Vietnamese delicacies. The adults like Vietnamese food more, but we do our best with turkey. My nephews and niece, middle-aged college kids, seem to prefer the American food, but we'll nibble on the Vietnamese food. My son, for whom I am grateful, makes a mess and soon runs off to stage violent battles with his Batman and Star Wars Legos. But the most memorable Thanksgiving meal in our family history preceded this turkey. In the mid-90s, my parents returned twice to Vietnam after a hiatus of 20 years. During those decades, the country was rebuilding from war. Uh, and I didn't go on these trips, but I wish I had seen what my parents saw. Because after the second trip, over Thanksgiving, my father said, "We're Americans now," and they've never returned. So it was kind of a it was kind of frustrating piece to read because, like, genocide. I mean, it's just I know you killed the turkeys, but could genocide. But he ends up on a pretty good place. So he ends up by saying, "Look, we have Vietnamese food. We have our traditions." But we're American, and so we do the turkey thing. So it was a piece that I started reading, thinking. Okay, I'm angry about this. And then by the end, I thought, this is actually okay. This is kind of the American experience. I hope everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving. Enjoy the time. Savor the moment, especially with your children. They'll be gone before you know it. You'll blink, and they'll be 12 years old like my daughter, and she's as tall as I am. Enjoy the moments when they're little especially. And when they're older, enjoy enjoy the fact that they're at a different stage in life. Uh, We're all very blessed. I'm blessed to have you as listeners. I'll be back on Monday, and God bless each and every one of you, and thank you for listening.